And now I am joined by Greg Dick, who is the director of outreach for the Perimeter Institute. Greg is uh, also uh, my brother. I was, uh, Greg's calling us today to talk about the grand opening of Perimeter Institute's Stephen Hawking Center. Uh, good morning, Greg. Good morning, Joel. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> Uh, and before we uh, jump right into uh, your grand opening there in Waterloo, maybe we should uh, tell the listeners, what is it that Perimeter Institute does? So Perimeter Institute is a theoretical physics institute. That is, we have a building full of some of the world's leading minds that are grappling with literally the, the universe's most fundamental questions. And uh, they spend their day collaborating and arguing points uh, that deal with the deep functions of quantum mechanics and the, the big pictures of Einstein's relativity and, and everything in between. And, and uh, your job there is Director of Public Outreach. What is it that you do for Perimeter Institute? So what I do and what I get to, my team get to do is we get to take the, the thinking, the leading edge thinking that the researchers are doing and try to share that with the Canadian public and beyond. And so to sort of step back, why, why would we want to do that? The, the key to theoretical physics research is it's really long term. So often in uh, today's world, we, we do things with sort of a much shorter term cycle. Here we're talking 100 years into the future. So if we look back 100 years, uh, theoretical physicists, they combined electricity and magnetism. That was what theoretical physicists did in the late 1800s. And now if we look at e and M. It's what drives our communication age of today. So that's, that's a hundred year progression. The science was discovered and understood and modeled by theoretical physicists, and now it makes a difference to society today. So what we're doing, what the researchers are doing, what they're thinking about will affect society a hundred years down the road. And my team, we get to take the, the best kernels of, of knowledge that, that the researchers are, are grappling with and try to package that for the general public and for schools, for students, for teachers, and, and share that with Canadians. And coming up uh, in just a couple of weeks, September 16th, 17th, and 18th, I know there's a full schedule of public events around the grand opening of the new Stephen Hawking Center. What's on uh, tap for those of us who uh, would like to, to learn more and see more and uh, engage in some of those public events? There is a lot going on. Um, first let me start by saying all the tickets are free and they can all be picked up online uh, from our website, which is perimeterinstitute.ca. So as I list these, uh, these different items, know that uh, there's more information on the website and you can dig right in and, and get your tickets for any and all of them. So first of all, Friday, September 16th, we are revisiting a very popular uh, activity we had at Quantum to Cosmos Festival two years ago called Science in the Pub, where we will have some of our researchers be led in a, in a debate to discuss some of some of the work that they're doing in in the Huther Hotel in a real in relaxed pub setting. The audience will be able to engage in questions with the panel members and lead walk through the discussion of of modern physics thinking. We've expanded that to not only science in the pub, but we're also going to have science in the club, where in the Starlight Lounge uh, there will be another uh, high energy physics debate at the Starlight Lounge in downtown Waterloo. Well, that's Friday night. Um, then on Saturday, there is a Doors Open Ontario. It's a historical tours of, of buildings across the province, and it's that, that Saturday in September when this happens. We have always wanted to participate but have never been able to. Well, this year we can. So PI's original home, which was on 35 King Street uh, in downtown Waterloo, We've now moved into the new building. That building we're now opening up for historical tours so people can come through and take a look at the original building. It's got the old clock tower uh, on the main floor. We'll have exhibits showing the, the progression of that building uh, as from the old post office through to the different owners, the Times Square uh, restaurant, and then through to PI. And on the second floor, we have a Physica Fantastica exhibit. So this is where we go from stepping into history, we step into science, and there will be hands-on activities where young and old can participate in the actual science. Uh, Dr. Epp has put together a real myriad of, of good opportunities for people to play with. Uh, I was just at the fortunate opportunity yesterday, we were looking at 
holograms. He has really large-scale holograms that are truly unbelievable, and he ties those into a current theory of everything, of the universe. So lots of, lots of fun things to do on Saturday. And then on Sunday, it's the new facility, the grand opening of the new facility. So we'll have tours. Uh, their, their tickets are being sold in half-hour increments, and we expect about 10,000 people to come through. You'll be able to tour the entire building, as well as there's another Physica Fantastica presentation in the atrium uh, of the new building, where, again, we'll have one of the highlights would be a black hole in a bucket, and you can get right in there. It's good for all ages. A black hole in a, in a bucket. I'm I, I'm frightened. You're not you're not going to destroy the universe on us, are you? Well, you know, just like CERN got some good publicity over making little black holes. We thought we'd dial that up, make it a little bit bigger. Yeah, this black hole in a bucket truly lets you put your hands right on the event horizon of a black hole. That's all I'm going to say. It sounds scary. It's not quite as scary as it sounds. But there are some some really good activities that uh, they can come and enjoy. And then there are also four public lectures. So there's Natalie Toro. She is a, a, a PI resident. Todd Lipson, talking about 3D printing. And uh, I know you've heard me rant on about this 3D printing before, uh, but for your listeners, it's, I, I just can't believe where this is going to go. So Todd Lipson came and gave a public lecture two years ago at, at Perimeter on Robotics. And then I just had the opportunity to be chatted over dinner about his, his sort of new research that he was entering into is this 3D printing. What that means is, on, on the simple scale, imagine your toothbrush, say. Instead of going to buy a toothbrush, you download from the internet your, your customized favorite shape and color, and you have a little printer, you press the button, and it builds this, it, it builds the toothbrush. Imagine that for, for toys, for children's toys, or for cutlery, for dishes. Todd believes and, and is happy to share, and I'm really looking forward to hearing where things are at now, that eventually even as your BlackBerry, your iPhone, could be printed. So it's going to change the base of manufacturing in this world when you can do it, customize everything you want at home, or if you have to repair something. Instead of throwing it out because it's garbage, you can, you can just print the replacement part. So that's pretty exciting. Um, George Dyson... Uh, son of Freeman Dyson will be here. He's a scientific uh, uh, historian. And then Julie Payette, our famous Canadian astronaut, will also be here to share uh, in the public lecture series. So that's all on Sunday. And, and uh, tickets for free and can be, can be ordered online. And that's right, and ordered online from, what's the website again? So it's uh, www.perimeterinstitute.ca. And so the tickets are free, but of course, because of limited seats, people uh, should go online and order those tickets ahead, not uh, hope to just show up and get in. It, it's best to order that ticket, right? Absolutely. Uh, every, the, the Physica Fantastica and the tours, we, we hope to have the capacity to let uh, walk-ups get in, but all of the other events for sure will be sold out relatively quickly, so you'll need a ticket. And your best, your safest bet is to definitely get tickets on, on all fronts. And Greg, what does uh, I know? We're, we've been talking a lot about the grand opening and the, and the public lectures and some really interesting stuff there. But what is it that the new Stephen Hawking Center does for PI that the old building wasn't able to do? What it does essentially is doubles our capacity. And the reason that's important is that the the foundation for PI is collaborative research can't have a monopoly on the great minds in this world who are grappling with some of these big questions. The, the key to success is to bring them together, to collaborate, to, to, to argue their ideas, and then to, they go back to their, their home countries, their home institutions, and, and continue the research. And the key for us with this new facility is that we will be able to have 300 researchers here at any one time which feeds perfectly into that, that philosophy where we have guests. We have short-term guests and long-term guests. There's the, the core group of researchers is maybe will be a third of that. So two-thirds of that 300 will be these flow-through of the best and the brightest bringing their ideas from around the world. And it's Neil Turok's vision that it's the intersection of all these, good, these great thinkers where you get big ideas that really move us forward. And I guess that's the part which I should have mentioned right off the top. So when PI is, is when the researchers are doing their work, 
there are sort of eight different uh, fields of study that, that are all working on different problems in different ways or attacking the same problem from different perspectives. And it's that ability where we can look at a problem from so many different perspectives that really can move things forward. And that's the new facility is truly designed to help the researchers do that. And Greg, I, I was lucky enough uh, to get to see some of the new facility because you worked there when it was still being built. And the real nuts and bolts of that, uh, those collisions and those collaborations, is the Black Hole Bistro and uh, and chalkboards and, and whiteboards and glass boards. Uh, tell the listeners a little bit about uh, how just the cafeteria there is, is different than what they might see at a, a regular cafeteria. The, the, the Black Boards are absolutely everywhere. In the old Black Hole Bistro that you mentioned, Joel, we literally had a wall of blackboards where science happened just spur of the moment all the time. You wouldn't walk in there and see that board empty. It's, it's just sort of the culture of the place. And it's, it shows it shows the, how dynamic science is, too. I think it, you, you scribble on the board, you're thinking out loud, and it, it can be erased. It can be moved. Everybody always asks, ooh, if I erase that, will that, will that change something? And the quick answer is no, because it's so dynamic. They're always thinking and talking and drawing, and they could reproduce it in a different way in the next second. The Black Hole Bistro is now expanded, and it's two stories high, and it's been placed right at the front of the building. And our director, Neil Turok, says the ideal day for a researcher should be that they don't get past the bistro. They come in those front doors, and they see their colleagues, and they get into a heated debate, and the next thing they know, it's, uh, it's 8 o'clock at night and it's time to go home. So the, the bistro is, is the hub for this collaborative approach. And, and you'll, uh, I think you'll be pretty, pretty amazed with what it's, uh, what it's shaped up to be. It's, it's two stories. It overlooks the reflecting pond. I really have to pinch myself every time I eat lunch there. And I think that is uh, it, it's such an amazing uh, piece of work. And, and like you say, because it, it makes real when we talk about collaborative science and people might think of, you know, maybe they've been in a university class that was a little dry or maybe they've been to a public lecture but there wasn't really a chance for uh, for stimulating questions. But what you guys are trying to do at, at Perimeter is really put researchers in proximity with each other, an idea not unlike uh, the Mars Institute here in Toronto, but put them right in proximity with each other and just let science happen. Let uh, these people coming uh, with diverse opinions and diverse ideas and that the problems from different directions and, and watch them work. And that it must be a, it must be an exciting and a fun place uh, to get your morning coffee and to uh, see these conversations going on all over the place. Oh, that's so true. And, and this, again, is a story that Joel's heard many times, but it, it just... It, to give you, your listeners a sense of, of what the science really is like, when I first started here, I was helping build a, a resource on quantum mechanics for high school teachers. And I asked at lunch in the bistro uh, at my table what I thought was a simple question. I just needed some clarification, and I'd get it from the best and the brightest. I said, so what exactly is a particle? Pretty basic question, I thought. Well, two weeks later, the Quantum Foundations Group held a four-hour seminar where they debated heatedly what a particle actually is. So I sat in on the four hours. I can tell you I understood uh, less than a fraction of a percent of what was going on, but what I took away was this unbelievable feeling of it. It, you're so inspired by how, how much there isn't, there, how much more there's to know, and how, how we can just dig in and, and you are, we argue those science points, and we have to share that with our students and have to share that with our teachers and the general public. Science isn't that series of facts. It's not memorizing the periodic table. It is alive, it's dynamic, it's real, and it's growing, and there's so much left to do. We all love a mystery, and science offers the best mysteries there are, and that's, that's what PI is all about. In perimeter, and, and we've been talking about the core, the core mandate, the the collaborative science, the research of those, the cutting edge, best and the brightest, but also along with that, uh, PI has always taken outreach to the public uh, very seriously. It's always been part of the mandate, the public lectures, uh, the Ellis and Bob uh, videos that we haven't talked about today, but maybe you can share a bit with our listeners, the International Summer School for Young Physicists. Why are these initiatives so important in particular to the Perimeter Institute? Why is it taken on this second, what I would say is actually pretty heavy lifting, trying to uh, tell the 
the public about science when, in fact, even scientists, there, there's so much debate and the public can so easily tune out. Why does Perimeter think it's important to take on this heavy lifting task of trying to bring science education to the general public? That is, that's a wonderful, a wonderful thing to talk about. So, first of all, our, my team, we get to, we get to recognize and then share that science truly is our best way of knowing. It tackles those big mysteries of our universe that will eventually lead to the, the technological innovations that drive society in that. And how best to integrate that thinking into the fabric of our society than to know exactly on the cutting edge what those mysteries are and then and share that with society. So, so yeah, why why is that important to, to PI? Well, from the science perspective, from the research side, you know what, we need to inspire the best and the brightest to take up the challenge in the face of all the options that they have that exist for top students so that, that some of those good thinkers will, will take, take the challenge and, and carry the science forward. But that's a small, small slice, and that, that is, is certainly important, and it's part of what our thinking is, and that actually ties to what the, the camp you mentioned uh, for, for young physicists, where we have 40 students from around the world spend two weeks here in the summer, and they are their high school students, and they get supercharged with some really complex physics, and they go, they go away and, and hopefully are inspired to, to continue with that. But on a much broader scale, it's sharing that science is our best way of knowing. It's, it's capturing the interest of Canadians, not that they're going to become scientists, not that they're even going to go into science but just that they respect and understand that the process of science is a crucial piece to our society. I want to know that there are lawyers and anestheticians and tax, taxi drivers that when they are thinking about science, they have a respect for how our scientific knowledge is generated and how it can help us. I think that will that'll feed our modern workforce. That will make for healthy life decisions when you're, when you're choosing uh, even what to eat. If you understand some of the science behind it, you're going to make some better decisions. And that's, a, that's the key part. So it's that scientific literacy. That, that's the heavy lifting that you mentioned. And we, that's what we really, really are tackling head on and feel privileged to be in a position to be able to do that. And, and uh, I want to come back to, uh, more generally to that scientific literacy part, but uh, lest uh, the listeners think this is, this is all hard work and, and all heavy stuff that, uh, like taking your vitamins in the morning, we're, we're telling you you should you know, visit the website and, and learn something because it's good for you. I'd love you to tell the listeners about Alice and Bob because you know, if you read a morning cartoon, I actually think Alice and Bob, it, they're good for a laugh, they're good for a smile, but they're also going to teach you something, and certainly they're a lot of fun, but at the same time tackling that uh, scientific literacy question. Right? Who, who are Alice and Bob? So, Alice and Bob, are, Alice is the, the younger sister, and, and Bob, the older brother, these are just young children. They're, they're, it's an animated series. And Alice and Bob together discover the nine biggest questions that people have asked about our universe. Uh, so one of the Alice and Bob animated uh, cartoons is about why is it dark at night. In 60 seconds, Alice starts off, she asks the question, why is it dark at night? Bob, like older brothers do, gives the quick response that turns out to be incorrect, but, but Alice doesn't point out that he's incorrect. She just continues to question, and they talk through the ideas. 60 seconds later, of these two characters chatting back and forth, and you have discovered a fundamental, a fundamental property of our universe. And all nine of them are designed exactly that way. They are 90 seconds long, and in the end, you're left with this kernel of knowledge and a, a, a big vector, a big arrow pointing you in a new direction of thinking, and, and you can grab it and run with it. And it's designed to do just that, to teach that core kernel and then inspire kids, adults, whoever, to, to look a little deeper. And you're absolutely right. It's, it's creating those resources and similar resources. It, that's what we get to do, and it is, it is a ton of fun. There's no question. Hey, to return back to that bigger question, though, we, we are a democracy, and ultimately that means that 
all of us have uh, some responsibility when it comes to public policy, not not to be experts, but to put those people in place who are going to make the big policy decisions. And generally speaking, we have a really poor level of scientific literacy in the general public. I think I count myself in that group. There's certainly always no, more knowledge you could have. Why? The first question is, why do you think our scientific literacy is at a, a poor level in Canada? Is it just because the science is moving so quickly around us? And what sorts of things do you think uh, we should be doing as a country on a bigger level to address uh, this deficit? So, uh, first, I would probably argue two things. One, uh, I don't think you can count yourself as scientifically illiterate. And two, we are probably, in Canada, in the top ten in industri industrialized nations uh, in terms of scientific literacy, so I absolutely agree with you. There is lots more to do, but we're not we're not lagging as far behind as some industrial countries are. So we are we're doing some things right. So the question is, how can we continue to do those things right and to to do more and to keep up with that fast pace change that that science is offering us? So I would say there's probably three key ways. At least there's three key ways that we try to to address. Number one, in terms of policy, is curriculum. Curriculum in schools is, is mandated to the provinces across the country. And if you look at the, the science curriculum across the provinces, some provinces don't have any modern physics at all in, in their curricula. So why is that a problem? To, to me, that's a big, big problem because what, what modern physics thinking allows people to do is to really see that science is a process. I think it's, it, it just happened. So the LHC, uh, some preliminary data was put out that, that now supersymmetry is, is likely to be, uh, to be debunked. Well, that's really early, uh, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't stand on any ground one way or the other on that. But I have received on my Facebook page, uh, this, this tirade from a former student telling me that, uh, that why, why would we teach supersymmetry as fact when now in fact it's wrong? And to me, that showed me that I didn't get through to that kid the true process of science. Science is never about fact. It is all about that process. It's about recognizing we build models that describes the world to the best of our ability based on the data we have. And those models will change, need to change. If they didn't, it's not worth studying anymore. Then we just look it up on Google and go on to other things. We're not going to advance. So modern physics offers a really clean, easy way for students to see that model building process. I think in, in many ways much easier than some of the other sciences do. And it, it helps them step away from that fact-based uh, thinking and more into a process of increment so that when new discoveries are made, those students can truly they celebrate that and say, oh, good, we're making an advance, not the response that I got on my Facebook page where, where this, this person was disappointed with the fact that he thought he knew something and now it's proven to be wrong. Um, so that's the first thing, curriculum. We need to continue to lobby the provincial uh, ministries to ensure that the curriculum has a, a proper focus on science. And to stop at modern, without modern physics means you're stopping at 1898. That's unacceptable. So there's one. Uh, in Ontario, however, we do have modern physics, but to be fair, in this latest iteration, there was, it was originally taken out, and it was lobbying through the Perimeter Institute and other institutions in Ontario that helped get it back on the, on the plate, thank goodness. The second, also related to schools and teaching, is PD. Educators have very little time allocated to pedagogical or subject-based professional development. Professional development often goes into the, the administration of the, the tasks at hand, the report cards and, and the, the meetings that have to happen. If we recognize as a, a, a public and we get people in, in policy positions that understand the need to keep your teachers current and to keep them current thinking about the best ways to teach and the advances of the subject, we're going to be better served, they're going to better serve our youth. And that's, I mean, that's, good companies recognize that. There's training cycles built into all of your top, country, top companies across this country, so we need to follow that model and implement that in the, in the school system and provide teachers with the opportunity to get out and to do that. And then the second, I think, uh, which goes right 
but to your point, getting the right people in the right positions. Funding. You need funding support at all levels of government. Recognize the value of science centers. Recognize the value of local museums. Recognize the value of festivals and, and all of those science fairs. All of those pieces takes it takes people in, in place to, to run them, and it takes funds uh, to access to make them successful. And if, if we continue to push on those fronts and have people in positions of decision-making able to, to recognize the need and the value, we're going to be better off. Greg, I, I really want to thank you for being with us this morning and opening uh, this window into uh, not only the Perimeter Institute's uh, Stephen Hawking Center grand opening, which is exciting, but this broader window into uh, how we stay scientifically literate and current and, uh, and how important that is uh, generally for society. Just quickly for the listeners, what are the, uh, the dates and, and where's the website that they can find information on the grand opening there in Waterloo? The grand opening is September, Friday, the September 16th, through to Sunday, September 18th. Uh, the website, perimeterinstitute.ca. Tickets are free, but log on and, and get yourself them because they will sell it. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Joel, well, it was a pleasure as always, and uh, have a good afternoon, good morning, whatever we're at here. <laughs> I think we've crossed the threshold, and, and you too. Have a great afternoon. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. And that was... Uh, director of outreach for the perimeter institute but also my older brother greg dick talking to us about the opening of the stephen hawking center there at uh, in waterloo at the perimeter institute uh, their new uh, building designed to uh, pushing forward and uh, giving us ever a better knowledge ever better uh, development but also talking a little bit today about uh, curriculum and about how we make sure that in the general public we have the kind of scientific literacy that a functioning democracy demands.